Hi, and welcome back to another edition of Toka Backstage. Actually, that's a fib because I am sitting in the lobby of the Armstrong Theater. So technically, this is Toka in the lobby. Um, I am honored and pleased to have uh, Mark Sanfilippo from Angel Town Combo with me today. How are you, sir? I'm good. How are you, Chris? Wonderful. Thank you for so much for taking the time. Um, so Angel Town will be performing in our studio cabaret Valentine's weekend. Um, it's a great experience for those who haven't uh, attended before because you get so you come in, you can have dinner, drinks at a table, and have a super intimate uh, performance. And my first question for you, Mark, is, is your wife as mad as at you as mine is at me for having something on Valentine's Day? You know what? We're both lucky to have supportive spouses, I'm sure. So, um, she kind of knew what she was getting into because we met in high school, believe it or not. Oh, We've wow. For a long time. And I've been playing music my whole life. So um, she's, I guess she's used to this, but maybe she'll be able to make it down. I hope so. Oh, yeah, that would be wonderful. It'd be, uh, it'd be great to meet her. So, so you've been playing music since high, high, since like you were a kid? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, thankfully, my parents were real supportive and got me piano lessons when I was a kid. And then um, I sort of started playing drums as a teenager and uh, percussion. I was in the LA Junior Philharmonic when I was a kid doing orchestral percussion. And then I kind of did my own rock bands, honestly, when I was in high school. Um, and then sort of discovered jazz and, and been sort of doing a lot of the jazz stuff ever since. How fun. And, and why drums? Uh, good question. Well, I think my dad was a bit big influence, honestly. He had some cool records um, growing up, uh, a lot of 60s stuff. He had, um, let's see, well, he had some of the Gene Krupa, Buddy Rich drum battle records, which were really cool. And of course, he had some Dave Brube Brubeck records, Take Five. I feel like everybody that went to college in the 60s, that generation, I feel like everybody had that record. Um, Herb Alpert and the Tijuana Brass, I remember some of that stuff. Um, so he was, a, he was a big influence on me and my dad getting me into some of that awesome. stuff. So um, tell us about uh, Angel Town Combo and what people can expect when they come. Angel Town is a project that I started um, years ago now. Um, we started mostly as a jazz band. Um, I get all the top players I know. These guys are like studio aces. Um, Chris Lawrence, our trumpet player, just got back from the Blue Note cruise. He was cruising around um, playing with Melody Gardot um, and all the top jazz guys were on that cruise. But um, Really, I, I kind of wanted to start a jazz band that was a little bit more accessible, I would say. So we're not playing heavy bebop, New York jazz. I mean, I do play that type of music, but I wanted something um, with Angel Town that was a little bit more danceable, a little bit more accessible, you know, good for festivals, good for just toe tapping music, having a great time, soulful. And uh, I think it just puts everybody in a good mood. I mean, jazz does that. But you know what I mean? There's, there's, jazz is a big word now. And there's, you know, I love jazz because, and I, I play in a few bands, as you know, and um, I like playing the early stuff, uh, 1920s New Orleans jazz. I love that stuff. I love bebop. I love swing. And then Angel Town is more, I, I'd say, like a 60s flair, you know? Awesome. Yeah. And, and the, you have a vocalist, and tell me about her. Lila, Lila Avila. Now, me and Lila go way back. Um, Honestly, we're both from a small town just east of downtown LA um, named San Gabriel, San Gabriel, California. And it's a real old part of um, Southern California. It's where the Spanish settled the mission. Um, LA, as everybody knows, Alvera Street is the oldest street in LA. But actually the people that started Alvera Street were born at the San Gabriel mission. So it's a lot of history. And um, I'm a few years older than Lila, but when I was a teenager, I was playing in a rock band, local gig here in San Gabriel, and, and a, a guy came up to us after the gig, he was like, oh, you guys are great, you wanna record a record? And, and we were so excited, we said, sure, we had never recorded before. And turns out it was John Avila, the bass player from Oingo Boingo at the time, really popular band, still popular to this day, with Danny Elfman, great film composer, was the sure. lead singer. And um, so John Avila, bass player of Oingo Boingo, produced my first record when I was a kid, and uh, here in San Gabriel, he lived in San Gabriel, same town. And I remember seeing a little girl in the background, um, in the backyard of his home studio, and that was Lila. And when she became a teen teenager, she started singing jazz. 
and we kind of um, did some gigs together and when she was a young woman. And then she actually moved to Europe for a while. And when she came back, I was starting this band up and I thought, you know, she's so talented and um, we're both in the same town. We both still live in San Diego. Well, she lives in Pasadena now, which is just adjacent. And so now we've been writing some songs together and full circle, we're back in the studio at Brando's Paradise, John's studio, um, recording our first uh, EP. We wrote six songs together and we're gonna be releasing that um, this year. So, uh, oh. Lila. That's awesome. You would think that with the father of somebody in Oingo Boingo, <laughs> your path would be other than jazz, but that's kind of cool. You know, John is a prolific and very successful bass player of all styles, believe it or not. I mean, he's well known for Oingo Boingo, but he can play jazz, he, play, he plays upright. He's an improviser, he's a, like a jam musician. And he's an incredible producer and recording engineer too. So we're lucky um, we have that relationship and he's, he's been a big inspiration for, for the band too. Well, and I've noticed too with a lot of musicians that they, while they may perform in a specific, particular style of band, that's not always necessarily all they do there. I mean, there's tons of different things that they do. Yeah, I mean, you know, most of the musicians that I know you know, you, you might be pinned down and people, obviously, we like to categorize things as human beings, labels, that's the way we communicate. But yeah, I mean, jazz musicians in particular, once you know, the thing about jazz musicians is we practice a lot, right? So, and we know the theory, we know, we're kind of nerds, honestly. That's why they call us jazz geeks, jazz nerds. That's fine. I mean, I take that as a compliment because what that means is, you know, we took the time to study the craft, study our in instrument, study the, even the anthropological side of it, sociological, where did it come from? Why does it exist? You know, and then all the mathematical stuff of the harmony and the rhythm. And so once you become an expert on your instrument, it's actually kind of cool. You can play any style, to be honest. You can, and, um, and it's just, that's what it is. I mean, you can, you know, we can play soul music, we can play funk. We can play rock and roll. I mean, you saw me playing in Tom Kenny's band at, at your uh, festival. That's straight up rock and roll, rhythm and blues um, with uh, Tom Kenny in the high seas. But, and then the, you know, the umbrella of jazz, you can go as free as you want or as structured as you want. So um, that's one of the fun things about being a jazz musician, I'd say. Well, here's, here's a question for you that I, I don't ask a lot of people because I, I don't, I, I feel like you're well versed in, in all different styles of music. You obviously are well educated. We used to call this this series the uh, the uh, jazz cabaret, mm -hmm. and we would program all different styles of music, but primarily jazz. And we had a jazz singer perform who was exceptional. But I had a patron come up to me and she goes, you know, that's not jazz. Right, right. And I said, well. The jazz police. Yeah. <laughs> and I've I said, well, how would you, what would you call jazz? And she goes, well, I don't know, but that's not it. Mm -hmm. So open-ended question, what is jazz to you? That's a good, that's a tough one. You know, this is debated across the board. I mean, Wynton Marsalis, the greatest jazz trumpet player alive today, discusses this all the time. And he has a very particular opinion about what jazz is to him. And he's from New Orleans. He comes from a very um, great legacy and tradition from the source, you know what I mean? So he is uh, obviously an expert. And, um, but then again, there's a guy coming out of LA named Kamasi Washington, right? Tenor saxophone player, the young guys. And um, I don't think uh, Wynton Marsalis would even consider what Kamasi is putting, putting out. And this is on record, this is not me making it up. You can read stuff online about um, what certain individuals that are jazz uh, legends think about what is categorized as jazz. Um, like for example, what Kamasi Washington is putting out. The young guys from South LA basically. And for, for me, you know what, I'm not a, um, a critic, I'm not a, uh, I'm not, I'm not um, writing, I'm not a writer. I'm a musician, I perform live. And uh, I appreciate, I appreciate what, what happens when musicians get together and they come up with the sound 
and there, there's an intention behind it. So they're trying to express something from within their soul. And that's what we're trying to do as, as jazz musicians. And I understand, you know, trust me. I mean, jazz music is what? About a little over a hundred years old now. And the drum set is about the same age, honestly. So I've studied the drums. I know the history and I love it all. I love, like I said, I mean, I have a band called the Big Butter Jazz Band that plays early traditional jazz, New Orleans style. I have a band called Jack's Cats that you know that I play with that does sort of pre-bop, you know, swing music, but in a small combo setting. I've played in big bands. I've played in swing bands. I've played in uh, hard bop bands. I've played in soul jazz bands. I've played in a fusion band called the Tritone Asylum. I mean, so, you know, you can cut jazz into a lot of different categories over the decades. Usually, I mean, it's kind of convenient to think of decades of jazz. And it's not, the history is not that old. So it's still evolving. And, you know, you see once in a while, like there's these um, posters around town, jazz is dead and things like that. That's a big debate, right? After Miles went electric, um, a lot of people like the earlier Miles Davis stuff or whatever, you know, um, but it's not really up to the musicians to decide. Um, for me, it's, um, it's, a, it's a truly American art form. I think it's kind of interesting how um, some of the elements I think obviously need to be there. For example, like, I love the fact that um, in American jazz music, we always support each other. And it's not like there's no, like in European classical music, there's a definite European hierarchy with the conductor, first chair, second chair, and on down the line, everybody knows their role. But in American music, uh, it's sort of like a group thing, right? We're all equal, but the fun thing is we trade around. So somebody's gonna get a feature, right? Like the tenor sax player, now it's your turn. The rest of the band, the rhythm section is gonna support that and draw attention to it and kind of like collaborate. This, this, this idea of like, um, you know, collective improvisation that's happening and support, I think that's kind of an American concept, you know what I mean? Yeah. Music, so it's neat. Well, first of all, the one thing I liked about the list of styles of music that you, of bands that you play in is you didn't list tribute bands. So thank you for that. Um, <laughs> yeah. The other thing is, is that, uh, you know, when I was a kid, I was in, I was like uh, just out of high school, a friend of mine took me to a Spyro Gyra concert and said, this is, we're going to go see this jazz group. And so that was my first real, like, somebody said, this is jazz, and that was what I saw. And I was like, I don't get it. Was that like the late 70s? Was that yeah. Yeah. I'm, not that I'm dating myself, but yeah. And I was like, I, so I know that there's that, but that to me, that was jazz, right. because that's what somebody told me jazz was. But then I heard, like, jazz singers and, and you know, uh, New Orleans jazz and, and so it really kind of made, it made me perplexed. It's like, well, what is jazz? Or is it just like, you can say rock and roll, but there's all kinds of different kinds of rock. And roll. Exactly. There's no real answer. I mean, everybody has their own aesthetic in music, in culture, in art, in anything, right? So uh, what it means to one person, it's going to mean something to another person totally differently. And, you know, my other thing is I work in the theater, right? I work at the Geffen Playhouse. I've been working there a long time. And uh, the founding uh, producer uh, was Gil Cade Sr. One thing I learned from him, he would program a series, a subscription series of five plays, right? Every season. Now there's more than five, but back then it was five plays. And it would always be like, oh, one play, somebody's going to love. Uh, another play, somebody's going to hate. The third play, they're going to be indifferent about. And then a couple other ones or whatever. I can't remember exactly, but the yeah. funny thing was, you know, the one that somebody loves, another person's, that's the one that person hates, right? So that's the way it is with jazz too. I mean, people love fusion music. People go to the Baked Potato in Hollywood, which is a, a so-called fusion jazz club. That's one of the oldest clubs in LA that's continuously playing jazz music. Um, so there's, a, there's an audience for that, right? Yeah. And I noticed a lot of young kids now are really into traditional New Orleans jazz and swing. They get all dressed up. It's part, it's part of the um, fashion of it. It's kind of cool. There's all these bars in downtown LA that are sort of theme bars. Um, and there's kids like get, getting dressed up, learning how to swing dance and Lindy Hop and stuff, Balboa. And it's really, they call it trad jazz. Now, they don't call it Dixieland anymore. But uh, it's, it's, you know, I mean, different, different things are happening in, in, 
music. It's not, a, it is a tribute. It's not a tribute band, but it's like, it's, it's fun to learn those styles and to keep them alive. Honestly. Yeah. And so it's funny that you said what you did about Gil Cates, because it's kind of like when I do a season, yeah. uh, I, you know, I, I, I go to booking conferences. I see <laughs> millions of different things. And I, it's like, it's almost like my job is to disappoint everybody just a little. Right. <laughs> well, you got to keep them on their, on, on their edge, you know, keep them. It's, you can't keep them all happy. That's for sure. As you know. <laughs> well, and, and the one thing I love about the studio cabaret is it, it, it offers, offers us a chance to bring in artists who people in the South Bay may never get to see. Yeah. Cause they're either touring or they're outside the, uh, the South Bay area. Um, and they, they're being introduced to them for the first time. But it's like somebody, somebody paid me the greatest compliment. They said, you know, Chris, coming to the Studio Cabaret is kind of like Christmas because you never know what's in that box. But once you open it up, you're really glad you got it. Oh, that's and, great. Yeah. And I thought, well, that's really cool because that means people are willing to take the chance, come to see something, have a wonderful experience, an intimate experience. And, you know, with great musicians like you, just really have a great evening. I hope so. I think they're going to like Angel Town Combo. They can expect definitely some straight ahead jazz. And we're going to, it is Valentine's weekend after all. So we're going to do some love songs and um, some of the great American songbook, of course, that are classic Valentine's Day songs. They'll give you a good feeling. We'll probably throw in a couple of originals that you've never heard before. Awesome. And um, so it's going to be a mix, but it's always, it's always just joyful. It's coming from, from us. It's coming from a place of, wanting to entertain, but also have a high level, level of musicianship. So um, it's a combination. It's like a lot of the bands I play in are a little bit more introverted, you know, um, and that's cool too, but we're trying, to, we're trying to reach out to the audience and be more inclusive and have a fun experience really and, and keep things uplifting, um, you know, toe tapping and having a good party time, really. Awesome. Well, I don't know if I would label Tom Kenny as being, uh, you know, <laughs> But I, 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 I get what you mean. Um, so uh, one of the things that the foundation does, and I ask this of everyone I talk to, is we like to mentor young performers and people who are interested in, in performing um, and help them find sort of a path to uh, taking on performing as a career. As a, as a professional musician, what would you, what words of advice would you give to a young up and coming performer? Well, the best advice I think is really um, just start listening for jazz in particular. I could talk about jazz. Um, Cause like I said, I was a rock drummer when I was a kid. And I remember the first time I saw somebody playing jazz in real life and they had the brushes. I had never even tried that before. Jazz brushes for drums. And um, so I, and he was a local drummer. I saw him in old town Pasadena. Actually, there was a, a restaurant that had a big window I was walking by and I saw the drums. I start watching him. That's, that's so cool. I've never seen that. And so I asked him if he would give me lessons and he said, okay, well, who are, who are some of your favorite jazz drummers? Right. And I really couldn't name, I really couldn't name that many. I mean, at the time. So he said, you know what, I'm not going to take your money. He was really cool. He's like, he wrote down a bunch of jazz records. He's like, go out, buy these records. After you listen to them, you know, call me up and we'll set up some lessons. So you got to start listening. It's like, it's learning a different language, honestly. Um, so, and that's why sometimes it's inaccessible for people because they've never heard it. Like, like you said, when you heard Spyro Gyra, it's like, it's almost like, you know, if you speak English and then all of a sudden somebody's speaking Russian, you might, it might sound cool, but you don't really understand what they're saying, right? right. So you got to learn the language. And what that means to me is there's all these great recordings and now even with the internet, which wasn't around when I was a kid, you can go online and uh, you can watch the videos of all these guys too and really get into it. And then the second thing is, um, there's all these great players in town here. We're in Southern California where a lot of these guys live. And a lot of the guys from back in the day are still alive and playing. And my teacher was a really great drummer um, named Billy Higgins who did pass away. But at the time um, it was so cool because we were going down to Limer Park um, which is really the sort of cultural center of the African-American art scene, um, 43rd and Degnan. We would go every week and there's a jam session at the world stage. Um, 
back then there was another place called Fifth Street Dicks that had a late night jam session. I would go every week. And Billy Higgins, the, the reason why he called it the world stage was he wanted, he told me he wanted anybody in the world to feel comfortable there. So, you know, you don't have to feel intimidated to go to the world stage at Lamert Park. You know, everybody's welcome and you can go. And if you don't feel like confident enough to play, just go and watch, you know? Yeah. And then if you go, that's what I did. I went for about a year before I even played and I'm watching these guys play and I'm picking up their licks as we'd like to say. And then maybe after a year of that, I, I kind of built up the confidence after I had gone home and practiced a lot to sit in at the jam session. And um, that's what the jam sessions are for. You know, you go in and you get on the bandstand with professional musicians and you, and you, you see if you can kind of hang and, and that's the best way to learn. Well, I, I really like what you say about listening because um, it seems to me as a kid, you know, like back in the day, I, you just listened to, you know, top 40 radio or whatever kind of radio, the, you know, the genre of music back in the day when there was a radio station. <laughs> um, and that was sort of all you knew. That was your world. And, and yeah. to go outside of that, you would either have like a brother or a friend or know some old guy in a record store that would like turn you on to something that blew your mind. But that's, they don't have that much anymore. So, you know, everything is accessible now with the internet. So in that way, um, it's a level playing field and there's a lot of content, but you got to know what to look for, right? And so, so you have to have a mentor or somebody, a sound or something. Yeah, I know what you mean. Um, so it's free and it's accessible, um, but you just got to be able to look for the right kinds of things or whatever interests you, you know, you follow your own journey. Crazy. I mean, the thing about me was the first concert I ever went to was um, Poison, Slaughter and the Bullet Boys. I think I was in junior high and uh, one of my friend's uncles or somebody worked for the record label. They took us out. I think it was like, I can't even remember where it was, but um, yeah. It was like glam rock city, you know, we thought it was kind of cool as a 12 year old kid. I was like, wow. And then, you know, grunge music came out when I was in high school and it was like totally different. Um, but the jazz thing really, thank goodness. I'm so thankful that I discovered jazz. Um, uh, Bobby Bradford, I got to give props to him, was one of my first mentors, um, a great cornet player. Um, and uh, that, used, that played with uh, Ornette Coleman, free jazz and avant-garde stuff. And Bobby's still playing around town, um, Bobby Bradford and the Motet. And the more money you spend, the Motet you get. That's what he <laughs> says. But uh, I mean, you know, you just discover what, it, what speaks to you. And for me, I never felt comfortable. I didn't feel like I fit in with some of that stuff that was happening when I was a kid. But I knew I loved music, so I was trying to find my way. I said, I don't, I don't, I don't get this, you know, music that was on the radio, mainstream radio. I, I was listening to it. That's all I had really access to. And, um, but I didn't fit in. I didn't feel like that was like where I was supposed to be. So thank, thank goodness I did find jazz and, I, and I'm, I'm really thankful for that. Well, and that kind of goes to, to some, what somebody, uh, another artist had said is to really be authentic, find your, what it really speaks to you and, and, and go with that. Don't, don't try to fit a mold that doesn't, isn't necessarily belong to you because A, you'll be a lot happier and B, you'll be a, a truer performer. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 it's figuring out what, um, again, what your intention is and what's the purpose? Like, why, why are we creating music and where's it coming from? You know, all the music I listened to when I was a kid, um, I feel like it was about other external things. Sometimes, sometimes, you know, it might've been for certain musicians about, uh, fame or money or, um, attention or maybe drugs in some cases or women or whatever it could be. Right. Um, and then the jazz guys, when, once I started meeting them, it was more about the music, um, the artistry, um, the craft, sort of um, self-improvement, self-reflectiveness, and then a whole spectrum of emotions that you can uh, portray through um, the real spectrum of, of harmony and, and rhythm that jazz includes. So there's, a, there's sort of a broader palette spectrum with jazz i find so you can in some ways uh be more expressive with with different parts of life you know that we all experience so for me that was um that was a cool moment of uh sort of uh discovering that and, and trying to figure out what it meant yeah and, and become a part of it you know that's awesome well thank you so much for taking the time i really do appreciate it yeah. mark
Oh, it's my pleasure. Yeah, we're looking forward to uh, coming down to Torrance Valentine's weekend, and and um, you got you have a great staff there, and uh, you've always been kind to us. So it's a great opportunity for us. Can't wait. Well, you make it easy because you're such a nice guy. <laughs> so again, that's uh, Angel Town Combo, uh, February 14 and 15 at the uh, Nakano Theater, and part of our Studio Cabaret series. Um, so we're looking forward to it. Um, hopefully your wife will come down. I'll see if I can drag my wife and they can just <laughs> stare at us, give us that gleam as to why am I here instead of out at a fancy restaurant? Well, while we're working, they can hang out. That sounds good. <laughs> there you go. All right, but thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right. Take care. Thanks a lot.